My guest today is Karsten Jeske, also known in FIRE communities as Big Earn, which is an acronym for the blog that he writes extensively on called Early Retirement Now, where he blogs about early retirement financial planning. I've had Karsten on the podcast a couple times now, where we've talked about topics like safe withdrawal rates, sequence of returns risk, and asset allocation. He's probably most well known in retirement planning circles for his detailed analysis of safe withdrawal rates. Well, with recent inflation and stock market valuations reaching historical highs, I wanted to bring Karsten back on the podcast to share insights on how early retirees and soon-to-be retirees should potentially consider adjusting their expectations in terms of safe withdrawal rates and maybe adjusting their portfolios too in terms of asset allocation, because the last couple of years have seen some pretty significant macroeconomic changes. Carson has a lot of expertise in this area. He holds a PhD in economics. He's a chartered financial analyst. He is taught as an economics professor at Emory University, and he's worked in economist roles at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, as well as the Bank of New York Mellon in the asset management group in San Francisco. Oh, and he's also an early retiree who fired at the age of 44. So I'm really excited to have Carson back on the podcast today to share his insights on macroeconomic trends and their impact on early retirement planning. Let's jump in. Hey, Carson. <laughs> sorry, hey. For, sorry for the, uh, the audio snafus a moment ago. We, uh, oh, we wrestled okay. a little that's bit and I, I had a, a setting in Zoom that was um, misconfigured. I, I think I had updated Zoom. Um, yeah. But uh, it's really great to have you back on the podcast again. I'm really excited to be chatting with you. How are you doing so far? It's been like actually quite a long time since we last um, chatted in our, in our last episode. What, what, yeah. what have you been up to? Um, you know, just the usual. Um, enjoying the dream uh, of retirement. Uh, we actually, we managed to travel quite a bit in 2021. So then multiple trips, uh, spent a week in Utah in, uh, during spring break, uh, traveled the whole month of July uh, to visit Colorado and Wyoming and South Dakota, so all the parks there, um, and then um, uh, visited uh, Virginia in October for a wedding, uh, and I went to FinCon. Oh, and, wow, uh, cool. And, uh, How was that? It was nice. It was very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it, was in, it was in Austin, right? It was in Austin, and it's obviously a nice location and everything, fun location, fun crowd, but it's obviously a much smaller crowd than usual. Um, yeah, I bet. And then, uh, and then I uh, went to California, of all places. So I went to uh, a little bit outside of San Diego. There was a Camp Fi. Mm. And uh, so uh, Stephen Bauer, mm -hmm. he runs these, and I was a speaker at the Camp Fi there. Uh, that's always a lot of fun. So it's a very small group and a lot of interaction between the speakers and the participants and everybody's, everybody's stuck there in this one location, right? So it's not like the, <laughs> the, the speakers can just hide somewhere. So you, <laughs> you actually, uh, th th that's what, that's what makes this so attractive, right? So you, uh, if you, uh, some of your favorite uh, fire influencers, you want to see them one-on-one, -on -one, you want to have breakfast with them and lunch and dinner and, uh, uh, that's that's a very good place to uh, to interact with the people from the fire and fire community. So yeah, that's awesome. Are, or were you uh, like travel driving, or were you flying? No, I flew, uh, and I flew to San Diego, rented a car there, and it was about an hour and a half to to drive up to the mountains. It's a beautiful scenery there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about in the parks and stuff that you went? Oh uh, yeah, so we saw uh, obviously Badlands National Park. Uh, and then some smaller parks in Wyoming and South Dakota too. Uh, so Rocky Mountains National Park we did a lot of hiking there, so that was very nice. Uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Were these driving trips? Uh, so flew to Denver, and then rented a car for three weeks. And uh, they actually had rental cars there, wow. so quite amazing. And we booked it early enough; it was a real bargain. So uh, it was very, very fortunate timing. Wow, uh, we did that, um, and. Um, yeah, so uh, it's obviously much less travel than we were used to from 2018 and 2019. Uh, but uh, we got, yeah, got to do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's some. Those are some good trips. I mean, I think travel right now is a is a gift wherever you can can yeah. get it safely. You know, pand pandemic safety. Um, but that's great. It's good to hear that you've been like definitely busy with a lot of things. Um, so you know, we're here to talk a little bit about. Um, uh, safe withdrawal rates, yes, and portfolio adjustments given all the macro changes that have happened since we yeah. last spoke. Um, you know, you're pro first though, I guess by way of intro, you're probably best known for your research on safe withdrawal rates. Um, but for those of you know who haven't caught our prior episodes together or, or just aren't familiar, you know, what is your background broadly when it comes to early retirement planning and wealth management research? 
Right. So, uh, yeah, I'm a former economist uh, from the Federal Reserve. Uh, did that from 2000 till 2008. Then between 2008 and 2018, I uh, used to work for Bank of New York, uh, Mellon Asset Management. So I did that for 10 years. And then uh, 2018, I had enough in, in multiple ways, uh, senses of the word, uh, and uh, so saved enough money to retire early. And that's what we did in 2018. And what I, uh, funny thing is, I actually found the FIRE community after I was pretty much already done with my FIRE preparations. I didn't even know that that movement existed until I was almost ready to retire myself. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously I'm a, I'm a math geek, a finance geek, an economics geek. I like spreadsheets. I like, uh, I like MATLAB program, Python programming, and I like uh, to do a lot of data analysis to, um, to see what are the risks of early retirement, right? And uh, so I wanted to see if there's something out there that can help me gauge the risks and just look at the trade-offs how much can we withdraw from our portfolio how do we how do you take a, a big portfolio which is a which is one dollar value and how do you stretch this out into withdrawals over the next 60 probably 50 to 60 years and i didn't really find too much interesting and uh, valuable information out there and i thought that um, maybe i have to do it myself uh, so at least i know it's done right and uh, so I built my own little toolkit for simulating uh, withdrawal uh, exercises and simulations uh, with past data. And then basically wanted to see what, what if I, with my situation, what if I had retired, say, in the 1960s or 70s, in the, in the not so attractive times to retire? So everything becomes really easy, right? If you retire in the early 90s and you have this big equity bull run, uh, but the, the, the scary scary situations and the scary historical retirement cohorts obviously would be something like 1929 or the 1960s and 1970s. And uh, so the question is, would, would my personal situation, would I have survived um, some of these uh, historical worst case scenarios? And what I found is that, yeah, uh, people would normally simulate retirement horizons up to 30 years. If you're lucky, 40 years and my concern was that, well, what if I have a 60 year horizon? Maybe I can't retire at all. I mean, there's not mm. a safe withdrawal rate at all, right? I mean, safe withdrawal rate is zero. So sorry, keep working. And uh, I, was, I was actually positively surprised that, um, well, what is normally considered a safe withdrawal rate, say over 30 years, somewhere around 4%, you don't have to reduce that a lot to stretch that into a 60 year uh, retirement horizon. So. Um, and uh, so anyway, so that's, that's what I started doing. And funny thing is, I just had my um, kind of five-year anniversary, not the five-year anniversary of the blog, because I started the blog in two, early 2016, but my safe withdrawal rate series, uh, when, mm. when I started writing more seriously about the, the withdrawal math, uh, that's what I started in December 2016. So that was just the, the five-year anniversary. And I just today, because we're recording this on January 3rd, uh, I just published the 50th post in that series. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it has obviously grown. Obviously, I had maybe a material for a handful of blog posts back in 2016, right? But the, I mean, as, as this goes, right, one thing leads to another. And you, um, most of it, because actually most of it because of feedback from readers, right? And interaction mm -hmm. and comments from readers, um, people ask you, well, have you tried this or have you tried that? And, uh, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not your personal research assistant and uh, people tell me something <laughs> and, and I run the simulations for you. But if it's something that I find uh, interesting and exciting enough, yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's a lot of my blog posts came out of that interaction and people asking me, hey, have you mm. tried this? I said, oh, yeah, that's, that's a really good idea. Because a lot of the, the quote unquote, the solutions to well, well, this is how you don't run out of uh, money in retirement. Can't you just do X, Y, Z, right? And then for X, Y, Z, you can fill in all sorts of stuff. Well, what if you have a cash bucket? Or what if you, uh, what if you include gold in your portfolio? Or if you, what if you have real estate in your portfolio? Or what if you are flexible, right? So uh, can't we simulate some of that? And uh, so, I, uh, so this is how the, the series has grown uh, so extensively. And uh, so have chase down all sorts of rabbit holes of what, what people can and cannot do uh, to, 
to alleviate some of that uh, that sequence because I haven't found anything that that completely convinces me that you never have to worry about sequence risk again. But uh, um, and uh, but uh, yeah, it has been has been a good run and it gave me the confidence to retire. Right? I mean, is it because sometimes people want to call me the Grinch of the fire community because I'm a little bit skeptical of the traditional 4% rule. And uh, so they think that, oh, I want to talk people out of retirement. I actually have talked more people into retirement than out of retirement in the sense that I've done some case studies for people who thought they needed a 4% rule and 25X annual expenses. And then I did the math and I found, well, even if equities are very expensive, um, because you have some supplemental cash flows that are right around the corner. Say, imagine you're a 52 year old early retiree and you can draw social security already 10 years down the road, or you have a company pension or any other uh, um, uh, supplemental cash flow. So once you factor that in and you can say that maybe in the future you can reduce your withdrawals a little bit, once that kicks in, uh, you might even uh, have a 5% withdrawal rate or a 6% withdrawal rate. So, uh, so this, Doing the analysis a little bit more precisely can actually go both ways, but it could increase your withdrawal rate if you find some idiosyncratic uh, uh, features and parameters in your personal life that would sustain a higher withdrawal rate. I mean, for me personally, when I retired, I yeah, I, I looked at our supplemental cash flows, but it turned out that uh, you know it's too far in the future and it's also not that uh, large. Our social security and a, a small company pension is probably not worth that much. So we were, we were significantly under 4% in our uh, spending target. Uh, but then of course, uh, the 2018 the market has actually done really well since 2018. So it, uh, it turns out that um, that initial 3% was actually too conservative because uh, our portfolio has now grown and uh, we're, we're now withdrawing much less than even that 3% initial rate. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, so uh, that's that's a little bit my background uh, and as uh, my yeah my little uh, claim to fame and my little niche in the fire community. Yeah, I remember that's exactly how I found you. I was just searching around. I was you know kind of doing some deep reading on safe withdrawal rates, and I, I was like reading post after post. And I was like, oh wow, this is really in depth. So folks, you should definitely check out the series. Um, I remember that you have like um, spreadsheets that you can download, right? But um, right. Did, did, did you ever, I'm not sure if uh, I recall this anymore, but uh, was there like a website software tool like Portfolio Visualizer or Seafire Sim that you've made as a result of this? No, I mean, these are all external providers and uh, I have a Google sheet and I post that, I maintain that, I add um, the, the most recent uh, the asset returns to that. So I think right now the asset returns, they probably go to the either the third or fourth quarter of 2021. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you still have to download that sheet and uh, do your own calculation. So uh, it's not, um, I, I haven't made a business out of this yet, right? I mean, for example, what you could do is you could just transform this into some kind of a JavaScript and uh, make that into an app or have this as a standalone uh, a website. Uh, so yeah, I mean, right now it's a, it's a spreadsheet and it has some advantages and disadvantages, right? I mean, it's obviously not quite as consumer friendly and user friendly as say uh, some of these very nicely designed apps. Uh, but I mean, the nice thing is uh, uh, all of my formulas are right out there, right? I mean, there's nothing hidden. There's nothing protected in the sheet. Uh, you can see all my formulas. You can see the returns I'm using. Um, and yeah, I, have, I have actually pretty uh, extensive return uh, series coverage. I have uh, obviously equities bonds, uh, so the 10 year bonds, 10 uh, year US Treasury benchmark bond. I have the short term cash rates, so a three month uh, T bill rate. Uh, I, uh, you can use the, uh, the pharma French factors, right? The, the small uh, cap uh, and, the, and the value over growth uh, factor. Um, I have gold. Uh, and if that's not enough, you can also feed in your own custom series if you want. So for example, if you want to bundle some kind of an active strategy and simulate your own returns that are packaged into an active strategy or, or any other strategy, uh, you can package that too and, and run this with your with your own custom series. And then, I mean, again, because it is a spreadsheet, right? You can you can then copy and paste the, the simulation results and, and move that into 
into your own personal spreadsheet. So, so in that sense, it's a, it's a, it takes a little bit, a uh, little bit more work uh, on the end user. But once you've mastered this, is is definitely a very, very nice tool, uh, and uh, it has has a lot of. Uh, a lot of different ways to play around it. I mean, it turns out that, I mean, I, for example, I started with the running a lot of this as big MATLAB uh, programs. And I think in the beginning it was useful because I, uh, I wanted to loop over every single possible combination of parameters over different lengths of the retirement horizons over different stock bond weights. Uh, and um, uh, so that back then I had to do via uh, via MATLAB because this, I think it's at some at one point I had to loop and if you counted all of the different steps in the loop I think I, I stimulated something like six or seven million different uh, mm. uh, retirement cohorts uh, so every cohort with all the possible with all the different combinations of parameters uh, but a funny thing is everything I've been writing recently that I publish on my blog where I publish simulation results. Is usually derived off of that Google sheet. Mm. So, uh, and uh, I mean, that, that's really how useful that sheet is. Nice. Uh, and um, if, if, if I can write 5,000 word blog post with that, I mean, uh, probably if you want to do a quick and dirty run of your, of your own retirement uh, uh, case study, you can, uh, you can certainly do that with that Google sheet. Yeah, well, so we'll definitely link to that in the show notes. That'll be super, that's a super useful um, resource. I'm uh, just curious, like, do you, um... What do you think about the other kind of publicly available tools like Seafire Sim? Are they valuable? Do they have a role? Like, do you use them or have you checked them out before? And kind of what, what's your what's your yeah, a, a assessment yeah, of them? Yeah, so actually, Seafire Sim was the first one I found, and um, I initially worked with that and tried to derive my own, um, try to write some blog post based off of that. And because I think you can also export some results from Seafire Sim. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's very quickly you reach the boundary of usefulness of uh, some of these apps. Uh, I think the most the most concerning problem with uh, with everything else out there is that a lot, at, at least everything I've seen so far, they do annual simulations, right? Mm -hmm. So they do just one single start date, and then you withdraw the entire annual withdrawal in basically on December thirty first or on January first. Uh, and uh, so the biggest concern with that is that uh, obviously it's in something like 1929, right? The peak was in September 1929, right? So if you simulate around the 1930s, you get a much higher safe withdrawal rate, right? Because you either do the December 31st, 1920, uh, uh, 1928 or the December 31st, 1929, and you don't capture this, uh, this market peak, which was a real, because between the previous year end, you had some huge run up in the stock market. Um, and then you already had a pretty big drop uh, from, that, uh, uh, from that big market crash down to the end of the year. So you would then miss probably one of the worst times to retire. Uh, and uh, you would artificially increase your safe withdrawal rate that way. So I, I Feel a little bit troubled by that and then the other thing I'll, I'll feel troubled by is that i think that and i think this is this is basically the background of the people who wrote this right i mean a lot of them are more the the techie people uh the the, the it engineers and they they run these simulations they said oh wow i found there's only a two percent chance of running out of money in retirement and this is fantastic i'm going to run with this right and of course what people then don't understand is well it's not really a probability for, to begin with right so it's, it's 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 a historical ratio but yeah okay um let's call it probability uh, it's, it's, it's not really quite 100 percent uh proper but let, let's call it a, pro a probability but if you call it a probability it's obviously an unconditional probability mm. right and it's unconditional because uh, uh, there were tons of times when you when you don't run out with a four percent. There are tons of times where you don't even run out with a six percent safe withdrawal rate. Uh, but those were all the times when equities were really cheap and bond interest rates were very high, uh, which is very much unlike what we observe today. So in that sense. Um, as a, what what a lot of people call probabilities are really worthless numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, we want to calculate if we want to calculate quote unquote probabilities, 
we should do the probabilities conditional on where we find ourselves today, right? Because the, you, 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 otherwise you would constantly make these mistakes where um, if equities are really expensive, um, then probably 4% might be a little too high. But if you find yourself at the bottom of a bear market, then 4% would be insanely low, right? You should probably go to 6%. So you should condition your withdrawal uh, math to your current market conditions. And I, I sometimes have the feeling that the people who are outside of finance and economics don't, don't really appreciate these, these valuation issues, right? So whereas I don't know you've talked to people who have a CFA charter or, or, or econ or finance PhD, so everybody speaks the same language and that everybody realizes that, yeah, I mean, we, we don't want to take these unconditional probabilities like they do in, in a lot of these uh, um, alternative um, um, simulation uh, packages. And this is why, I mean, I, I certainly also report the unconditional failure probabilities, but then I also drill down and well, what's the failure probability conditional on being at the market peak or being 30% below the market peak, right? And then you can see, well, obviously 4% might be a little bit shaky conditional on being at the market peak, but probably if the market has already dropped by 30% and the CAPE is under 20, uh, you would be crazy if you go below 5%. So this, this is, uh, again, bring some, bring some finance into, into this because this is obviously a, a very financial and, and very, very quantitative uh, real world problem, right? This is not some kind of a, you know, this is not some kind of a statistics exercise where somebody pulls balls out of an urn. Right. So, or, or if, or if it is right, then you would have to understand, well, you know, there might be multiple urns. Uh, and uh, if we consider the, the overall probability of all the urns, yeah, maybe the 4% rule has only a very small failure probability, but if we only draw from the urn that has market conditions, like we find ourselves today, right. With the Cape above 30, actually almost 40, uh, and interest rates really low, then probably you want to be a little bit more cautious. And, and, and again, so these, these are all these things that were on my mind um, when, when, I did, when I did my retirement calculations. And uh, I thought, you know, before I quote unquote throw away uh, probably 20 more years of potential peak earnings in the finance industry, I want to be a little bit more certain about, uh, about what I'm doing here and not uh, do something based on, well, I, I read something on the internet and I, I retire. It's almost like this, this commercial, right? With the guy who stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night, right? So, um, the, and so I, this, is, this is where I'm coming from. I, I, I want to do a, a more serious and a, and a robust analysis of, of some of these issues. Yeah, it totally makes sense. So again, we'll, we'll make sure we link to that stuff because I think it's important for folks to um, be able to see some of the rigor. Um, now I definitely want to talk about some of these issues. Uh, just before I jump in that, though, like, what are the big projects that you're up to, you know, these days? What's what's keeping you busy these days, um, other than the conferences and stuff? Right, right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm still blogging. I have definitely taken down the the blogging frequency. I maybe only publish one or two posts per month. Uh, and uh, but I, when I publish something, it's usually something a little bit more extensive. It's something like a three, four, sometimes five thousand word post. Uh, and uh, it takes me a little bit longer to write that. Um, and uh, yeah, on top of that, I do, I do a, little, a little bit of consulting. So I uh, work uh, for a startup and uh, so no salary, but I, I would get some equity uh, um, out of that if, it's, if that ever becomes valuable. It could also be worth zero, in which case I work for free. Uh, but uh, yeah, so do some, as also, uh, um, number analysis, right? So some economic forecasting. Uh, so forecasting, for example, expected returns. There are some processes that, that, we're, uh, that we're trying to write and then uh, market where, for example, uh, equity, bond, and cash commodity expected returns would have to be determined. Uh, th that was something I developed. Um, I did some uh, economic forecasting, so the GDP forecast I did for them. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, um, I mean, you don't have to pay me for that. I'll, uh, I find that uh, interesting and intriguing and fascinating and worthwhile doing even without a salary. But if I, if I make a little bit of money off of that, eventually, uh, uh, that would be nice too. 
Um, and then I just finished uh, teaching a, a class in the extension program at UC Berkeley. And oh. I taught introduction to microeconomics of all things. So which was actually one of my favorite classes when I was an undergrad. So, uh, so I had a lot of fun with that last year. Uh, that's just wrapped up and um, I'll, I'll see if they, if they want me back, if, if, if the students, I, I hope the students liked it, man. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, so I, a lot of these things evolved, obviously. Um, I, I have to say that, you know, with the whole shutdown and you couldn't travel much in 2020. So I definitely took on some additional projects just so just to be busy, right? Because uh, if you're cooped up at home much um, and uh, you want to stay busy and, uh, and involved, so. Sure, sure. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about kind of what's going on um, in, in the sort of the macro economic landscape right now. So sort of given all the havoc that the pandemic has wrought over the past, you know, many quarters and the likelihood that, you know, we're not so close to being out of the woods yet. Um, at the time this recording, Omicron is still raging. Uh, do you, you know, what macroeconomic shifts, if any, do you feel like have happened that are going to stick or linger for a while that retirees and early retirees should factor into their retirement and financial planning? Uh, and if there are such shifts, like what, what are they? Yeah. So, I mean, so we're recording this in early January, 2022. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so this is with the best of my knowledge as of today. I mean, it's, it's really quite intriguing and, uh, uh, and amazing how well the economy has recovered, right? Because the, the GDP, has, GDP has already reached a new all-time high, right? Um, corporate profits are way above their Q4. Imagine we take the Q4 2019 as the last quarter before the pandemic hit. Uh, I, I think the Q4... The, the two-year growth of uh, earnings was was almost forty percent, right? So, uh, so definitely corporations are doing very well, and it so it, it already shows you that right, when when the economy is just barely back to the old high and uh, corporations have grown by forty percent, right? So it it shows you that there's probably been some distributional impact of uh, of the pandemic, right? So if you just look at the overall uh, average macroeconomic uh, variables, yeah, everything looks hunky dory and everything is back to normal. Uh, but there's definitely been a, a redistribution, right? It's a redistribution from, and it's actually a, the the kind of redistribution that you obviously don't really want necessarily from a mm. societal point of view, right? It's a redistribution from poor to rich. Right? It's a redistribution from um, small mom and pop proprietary companies, right? Uh, uh, small mom and pop companies to, to corporations. Even within the corporate world, right? There's a, there's a redistribution from smaller corporations to larger corporations. So, so all, of the, all of the distributional shift have all gone in, in a direction that, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, lucky for me, right? Because my, my equity portfolio increased and uh, I, I didn't have to sweat anything about losing a job. I didn't have to sweat anything losing a business. Um, I, um, we did sweat a little bit because we had to homeschool our daughter for three months in 2020. So that, that was uh, probably my biggest cost and headache and heartache uh because the the kindergarten was shut down for three months but i mean that that's that's pretty much the only cost that that we really face right i mean but imagine say so people who are single parents with with kids at home and they have a job where they they can't just uh they can't just help their kids with uh, with the help they need uh, or, um, I mean, the nice thing is so we live in a school district, I think, which, which is actually pretty well run. This is why we actually moved here. We live in uh, Southwest Washington. Um, so every kid, uh, when they did the home, when they did the, the, the online schooling, or they all got their own Chromebook, right? So it's, it's not like we had to buy anything. We could have bought something, but, uh, again, it wouldn't have been a big expense for us, but, um, think about again the the distributional impacts, right? What if what if the school didn't provide that, and parents have to buy laptops? Or imagine you're a single parent and you have two kids at home or three kids, and you have to provide the the laptop. And then uh, and and then by the way, so also so when our 
when our daughter was sitting in front of the laptop and doing that uh, that online schooling, right? It's not like you can just lay, leave the kid alone completely by herself and unsupervised, right? I mean, the, this is what this is what first graders would be doing. They, they'll just be uh, doing something else and not paying attention. So you almost have to still have a have an eye on on our daughter. But anyways, so so th this is obviously one of the one of the big concerns, right? That this is uh, what will this do to society long term, right? That there has been this shift and this rift. Um, and um, I mean, I, just just to be sure, right? I'm a, I'm a pro free market capitalist, right? I'm a, I'm not uh, uh, not not really lefty or anything. I'm, I'm definitely very much pro-capitalism, but uh, it, even then you have to concede, right? Is, could, this, could this have negative impacts long-term that, that we have this, uh, this shift and this redistribution shift? Um, and then, well, I mean, on top of that, right? We have uh, big government deficits. Uh, we have inflation running rampant a little bit, right? So not as bad as the 1970s, but it's definitely a lot higher than uh, than uh, than anybody would be comfortable with, at least long term. With short term, you can always take that kind of uh, term inflation spike, but uh, th this is not something that uh, that anybody would want uh, to last much longer. Uh, and um, and by the way, so we we can talk more in detail about inflation later. But uh, so one thing that that surprised me is how long and persistent the inflation shock was. Right? I mean, so it's obviously, so for example, if you look at well, what happens when the economy restarted, right? In the in the second half of two thousand twenty, right? You had this one big boost. Uh, I think we had one GDP quarter that was 33% annualized. It's not 33% quarter over quarter. It's a little bit less than that. So it's, it's actually less than 10%. Uh, it's probably maybe seven and a half percent or so quarter over quarter. And you annualize that and it just came out as some fantastic 33% uh, GDP number in the third quarter of 2020. Uh, but then uh, GDP has more or less normalized again. But uh, so I'm a little bit worried because I, I honestly thought that, you know, this inflation spike is going to last. It's very short-lived. Right? It's going to be the one spike when everybody wants to travel again uh, in the spring of uh, 2021. And, uh, and then it will basically wear out and uh, we're going to go back to basically two or two and a half percent inflation. And it's, it hasn't happened yet. And... Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's almost this procrastination problem, right? Where people say, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, if the 7% is not all right now, but it will soon become better. But if we keep saying this for a little too long, right? This is, this is exactly how, how the 1970s inflation problem started. And um, uh, yeah, so obviously uh, the, the other things, um, aside from the, from the distributional part, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's a little bit worrisome, right? We have very high debt uh, and deficit numbers. Uh, and um, it's, that's obviously not sustainable. So, so not only uh, is this going to be a problem on the inflation side, right? It's also a problem that, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the government spent a lot of money to get the economy running again. But what happens if the government at some point stops, either because they have to or they want to, right? Is this going to... Uh, create um, then, well, maybe not a recession, but something like a, a mini slowdown, right? Uh, not a full-blown recession, but a bit of a mini double-dip recession. So, I mean, I mean these, these are obviously uh, concerns on my mind. Um, no, I'm, overall, I'm still quite optimistic. I think this is all just going to uh, basically work itself through the system. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's definitely something on the on the horizon on my on my radar screen. So what like what are things that retirees should, I guess you know, for Joe retiree and Jane retiree, should they be considering changes to how they're doing retirement financial planning based on what is going on right now, um, or is it more to you know be aware? Uh, you know, over index on being a little bit more conservative when you have that flexibility, but not, there's no sort of very specific actions to take. Right. So again, so I'm obviously biased, right? So as, as an economist, I probably have this bias saying that 
economics is obviously the most important thing in the world and everybody should uh, should listen to that but i'm i sometimes i'm actually the opposite i i think that um uh, we should also not fall into this temptation where we hear something on the news and then we say okay i have to throw out everything i was planning because xyz happened and uh, we have to completely rethink everything the best example for that is uh, it's amazing how how much things changed in just a little bit over a year because if you remember in late 2020 we had very low inflation right and then all these people come out of the woodworks and they say well if inflation is really low that's actually really good for retirees right so and there was there was this um, I thought it was a really horrible article uh, written by Bill Bengen, right? You know Bill Bengen, right? He's a hugely popular and hugely appreciated guy. He's actually the inventor of the 4% rule even before the Trinity study. And uh, so was obviously if he's speaking and writing, uh, people would pay attention. But so basically he said, well, if inflation is low, uh, that means you have to make smaller cost of living adjustments to your spending. And that should help you uh, if you uh, if you're calculating your safe withdrawal rate. So all else equal, if you make smaller cost of living adjustments, that means your your money should last longer. Then he went through all of this elaborate numerical analysis, and then he found well we can raise our safe withdrawal rate from four percent to five point five percent just because inflation is so low. Uh, and uh, that was I, I looked it up. That was October 2020. And I, I wrote um, a post to dismantle some of the I mean, even not even knowing how bad the inflation problem is this this time around. I mean, even if inflation had been moderate, I, I didn't find this case very convincing, neither neither numerically nor uh, nor economically. And uh, I think it's it's part 41 of my series uh, that deals with that. So the long story short, I mean, I, I wasn't a big fan of changing anything drastically back then in response to low inflation. And I don't think we should do anything too crazy about, about high inflation, right? I mean, keep in mind, some of the best um, assets for inflation protection would be stocks, right? Because, uh, well, where does the inflation come from? It's corporations passing through uh, inflation pressures and uh, uh, and raising their prices and uh, corporate profits will be higher and they will keep up with inflation and uh, definitely stock prices they not only keep up with inflation right they keep up with inflation plus over the very long term I mean easily five percent uh, actually over the very long horizon it's, it's actually almost uh, your stock returns keep up with something like CPI plus six and a half or seven percent. So, uh, I mean, you have some sort of obviously inflation protection. Now, uh, of course, what's a little bit more worrisome is that, well, we can't really have 100% stocks in a retirement portfolio, right? I think most people on the way to retirement can probably keep 100% equities almost all the way until the end, or maybe even exactly until the end. But once you're in retirement, I think it's a little bit too risky to have 100% uh, stocks. If it works out really well, it's, it's actually a great strategy. And actually, a lot of fire bloggers probably have 100% equities, but that, that's because they can, right? They have probably income from their blog. Uh, they don't have to face uh, really the, the sequence of return risk of drawing down assets. Uh, and because if you do have a bear market right after you retire, uh, you definitely have some much higher risk of failing. Uh, so, so yeah, the question is, is I, I'm a lot more worried about your bond portfolio, right? So it's not so much the stock portfolio, but the bond portfolio. And uh, yeah, if you look at the uh, bond yields right now for government bonds is something like 1.6% for the 10 year and 2% for the 30 year. And over the next 10 year, <clears throat> I think the tips implied inflation rate is two and a half percent. So you have a negative 0.9% real return on your bonds uh, with uh, stock returns. I, I don't think you're going to have a negative expected return on stocks. Right? The stock returns are going to be positive, uh, at least in expected terms and even in, in inflation adjusted terms. But they're not going to be that high either, right? Because with the CAPE uh, almost equal to 40, um, yeah, so my recommendation is I don't think you have to do anything drastic with your portfolio, but you probably want to adjust your safe withdrawal rate, right? I mean, 
now is probably the time that looks, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that now looks really too close to 1929. I think that we look closer to maybe the 1960s, right? So where mm -hmm. um, the, the big inflation spike wasn't even around the corner yet, that, right? That took until the 1970s. Uh, and uh, there wasn't even a huge minus 70% equity market drop uh, ever in the 1970s or 80s, right? It's more, it's more of this, uh, this prolonged uh, period of going nowhere, uh, going nowhere, right? Your portfolio yeah. going nowhere, going sideways, right? Bonds are um, getting hammered. Bonds are not too, too much of a diversifier because uh, uh, you have high inflation and then high inflation and, uh, and a little bit of stagnation, uh, which is bad for the stock market. So I would be more concerned about that exercise. But it turns out, right, you know, even if we have a repeat of what say the 1965 or 66 or 68 cohorts went through. Um, again, I mean, it doesn't even turn out that you have to lower your withdrawal rate that much lower below 4%, right? It's probably still 3.5% is still seems pretty safe. Uh, it's not that big a haircut you have to do to your, to your retirement strategy. So, um, so, so that, that would be, I mean, so if you are in this, in this mold of say, Say the fire community or the bogle hats, right? For where the bo I think probably a big uh, share of the bogle hats, they were saying, you, you know, I want to have a uh, an equity index fund, and then there's a debate: is it only domestic or is it domestic plus international? And then have something like a uh, like a bond fund, right? And um, uh, and this is all index funds. And so if you're in this universe where you restrict yourself to just that. Uh, uh, that uh, that lineup of uh, of say Vanguard or Fidelity or Schwab index funds, um, I I think that yeah, there's a little bit of the concern, right? That uh, yeah, what if we look like the 1960s and 70s uh, again? And um, and I'm not saying that this is my forecast, right? But I, I would probably assign a something like 10 or 20 percent probability that it could be like that. And I'm sorry, I don't want to run out of money with the 20% probability in, in retirement. So I, I would like to hedge against that um, outside uh, risk. Um, now, the question is, um, could you expand your horizon, right? Could you do something like real estate investments, right? Um, uh, there are also some, uh, some alternatives to, to bonds that, uh, so for example, I dabble a little bit in, uh, in preferred shares, so preferred shares, they are a hybrid between stocks and bonds, right? so they pay a dividend um, and uh, it's much higher dividend. You have much less upside potential because there's, there's a notional nominal value of each preferred shares is usually $25. Uh, you can't really go much above $25. Some are trading at something like $30, but that's because their, their dividend interest rate is so high. So they're trading a little bit above par. But so, so this is not like a Tesla stock, right? That can go from $100 to $1,000. So uh, th there's up, limited upside potential. But I think there's also limited downside potential. And I think uh, I like a lot of these preferred shares because they have, uh, some of them have a real nice built-in uh, inflation hedge in the sense that they have adjustable interest rates. So they have, in, in, in this word, it's called floating interest rates. And uh, so some nice ones I found, they're, they're actually, I think the timing is really ideal. Uh, so they are fixed to floating. So that means they are initially fixed interest rates and um, yeah, something like 6% fixed interest rate. Uh, and then um, they are fixed until something like 2023 or 2024. And then they transform to floating. And the floating is usually some kind of a benchmark interest rate, like the LIBOR rate. Uh, and then it's something like LIBOR plus 4%. And the nice thing about that, so right now interest rates are really low uh, and I enjoy something like a 6% interest rate. And uh, of course, later on, I mean, who knows? We, if we have something like a repeat of the 1970s where we have double digit uh, interest rates and inflation rates again, that's fine too, because then the LIBOR will also be higher because then obviously at some point the uh, interest rates will be higher if inflation is higher. So uh, yeah, I mean, they're the obviously um, you can 
can do a little bit of uh, um, of, of shifting around if if you are if you feel adventurous enough to to do that. Um, and uh, uh, but as I said, so probably equities, just the the big uh, equity indexes, they have some sort of an inflation protection built in. Question is, what do you do about that? about that safe asset bucket. Uh, and as a, sadly, obviously, it means that uh, some of these preferred shares, they are obviously also quite volatile, right? So they have a lot more equity exposure. So if the equity market tanks by 10 or 20%, then some of these preferred shares, they will also uh, go down. So I always have to keep that in mind. But um, uh, yeah, so yeah, I don't, I don't think that I would really do too much with the portfolio. I would more or less play around with the with the safe withdrawal rate. Hmm, I see. So when you mentioned the preferred shares, are you investing in individual companies or like in funds that hold preferred shares? Right, like, right. Uh, yeah, good, good, good question. So uh, initially, I invested in a uh, in an ETF. So there's many different providers that have ETFs. Uh, I think the most liquid one is the PFF. It's done by iShares, but I think that has something like a 0.4 percent uh, expense ratio. And after I saw that, I said, well, 0.4%, it doesn't sound like much, right? But if we're talking so about what? something like a 5% yield, well, I don't want to throw away 0.4% of that and have only 46 So I, I could probably replicate that myself. So I looked at some of the underlying and then yeah, I also realized, well, maybe I don't want to have the fixed rate preferred because that again has the problem. What if we have a repeat of the of the 1970s, right, with the big inflation shock and interest rates go up to double digit, then I don't want to have a fixed rate five percent preferred share because that would that would then lose out if we have an inflation spike. But then I said, well, can't I just selectively look at only the floating rate, or or even better, the fixed to floating rate preferred shares? And uh, yeah, so I I, uh, I I post that I. I have to dig up. Where did I write about? So I, I have a I have a post where I write about my uh, my option trading strategy because I hold these uh, preferred shares in a, uh, in my account where I do the the options trading, and there's there's one post last year uh, where I do where I, I give people a list. So th these are the the different preferreds that I hold, and uh, these are all the fixed or floating. And there's I think I have a one or two that are relatively high rate, but they are fixed, but they're at a very high rate. So I was more comfortable investing in those, but I try to keep it to the only the fixed to floating, which you can't really do with some of these ETFs. So that, that, that's actually another reason to do it uh, by hand. And uh, the other nice thing is so I can I can do some tax loss harvesting, right? Because I have this whole big palette of um, uh, different shares and then most of them actually have really substantial capital gains built in now uh, but some of them were kind of bouncing around at plus minus zero and once once they dip enough below i do some tax loss harvesting and buy a similar one for the next 30 days and if that one goes down i sell that one again and go back to the old one uh, to avoid any wash sales and uh, so yeah, there, there's there, there are at least three advantages to having the to, to to doing this by hand, right? You save the fees. You can pick really only the ones that you like, and then you can do the tax loss harvesting on the individual security and actually on the individual tax lot level, right? Um, and uh, so that's that's what I've been doing. But yeah, I mean, apart from that, um, I, it's it's not like oh my god, I have to inflation proof my portfolio now, and uh, I. Never, never went that route. Uh, never felt that need. Even, I mean, and, and if I say that as an economist, um, it probably means something. <laughs> Got it. So you basically constructed your own <laughs> the Earn Eat Preferred Shares ETF, right? Um, and so, do you then? That means, like, you you have to actively manage it. Are you doing that with spreadsheets? And how often are you actually going in and tweaking? I mean, there's nothing to tweak, especially, I mean, as I said, a lot of them, I bought them many years ago, and these are all quality names. This is, I mean, think about, so a lot of these shares, they are big financial corporations. This is State Street, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, uh, Wells Fargo. And yeah, once they have these huge capital gains built in, right, I'm just going to keep them, uh, mm. collect the, the dividends every quarter. And uh, there's really not much to to manage. Uh, and the only thing I have to manage is that 
yeah, end of the year, but that's what people do anyways, right? I mean, they look at the different tax lots and they check, well, can I sell anything at a loss and to get the, get the tax write-off for the year? And then, uh, um, so I do a little bit of reshuffling. But over a long stretch, there's unlikely any of them are going to be in a loss position, right? Um, not, not in my personal case. Um, I think, I mean, because a lot of them are now trading above par. So, uh, so you want a $25 notional share like that, you probably have to pay 26 or $27. I mean, some of them are actually above $30, which is kind of crazy uh, because that means uh, eventually they can be redeemed and then you actually have a little bit of a capital loss, but uh, the, the interest along the way is actually high enough that it, it compensates for you, you for that. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, pro I mean, my strategy is buy and hold unless uh, at some point I need the money, uh, which I don't really see myself uh, needing the money. So because again, so this account, I generate probably over half of our annual budget uh, mm -hmm. is coming just from the dividends and interest that come out of these funds. Uh, another half comes out of the option trading that I'm doing on top of that because I hold these shares as the collateral uh, when I do uh, option trades because that's all on margin, right? There's nothing, there's no, nothing underlying. Uh, and and again, so that is roughly 30% of our financial net worth. So with 30% of financial mm. net worth, we can actually manage our annual cash flow. Mm. Uh, and uh, the the rest of the portfolio, which is uh, that's all pretty much 100% stocks or mm. uh, real estate funds. Uh, I'm I'm not even touching those. I just let that run. I see. And, so uh, you have 30. Well, your allocation is 30% in the kind of the earn preferred ETF. Right. Is that right? And that, earn that... preferred. So this is ETF. There's some closed end funds that hold muni bonds. So that's that's. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not that's not inflation protected. So I think they would get a little bit hammered uh, if you have uh, if you have an inflation shock. Um, but uh, yeah, again, I have the same problem again. I, some of them are actually quite have a lot of capital gains built in. If I were to sell them now and invest in something else, I, I would have a huge tax bill right. uh, from the capital gains. So they would be long term capital gains. So maybe eventually I, I might get rid of them. But I mean, in some way, you know, it's the, the loss, the, it's, it's already water under the bridge, right? Uh, the Fed announced they're going to do three rate hikes uh, this year in 2022, three more rate hikes uh, next year. Uh, they're trying to be pretty transparent, right? I think the even the timing is already pretty much uh, worked out exactly. So by March, they're going to work out uh, they're uh, they're going to phase out their their bond purchases, and it, then I think in the June, September, December meetings is when they have three rate hikes, and then they have three more rate hikes every quarter after that in 2023, uh, and then probably kind of a wait and see uh, if that's enough. Uh, and um, of course, if inflation comes in a little bit higher, they might step it up and do four and four. Uh, but um, in, in that sense, the, the damage has been done already, right? So the, the, we have priced in the rate hikes. It's already in all the curves. It's it's visible if you if you look at the the Fed funds futures, uh, the euro dollar futures curves. Uh, so the rate hikes are already uh, priced in by pretty sophisticated market participants. So um, and um, uh, even with that, I'm actually still uh, ahead with a lot of these funds. And um, uh, so I, I'm not so worried about the rate hikes. I would be worried about rate hikes that go significantly beyond what everybody has already priced in, right? So that, that would be the concern. Um, and um, and what, but, would that, what would that be? Is that like expectation plus, you know, 50 basis points or more? Yeah, I mean, that would be basically saying, oh, well, I mean, inflation is so out of hands. We now have to raise rates 25 basis points every meeting, right? Which is which would be two percentage points per year. And yeah, very quickly, we could be at 4% rates by the end of 2023. Um, and uh, yeah, that, will, uh, that would definitely be a bit of a cold shower for everybody, right? For the bond market, for sure. And probably also for the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, yeah, I, th I think uh, obviously the, the Federal Reserve, I, I used to work for the Federal Reserve and, and um, uh, I, I still have friends working there and everything. So, I mean, uh, um, 
obviously they're trying to exude some some sort of a confidence that <laughs> they have everything under control but i think they're, they're probably sweating bullets a little bit they yeah, say well totally. yeah you know i mean uh, we already thought i mean it's a bit, for example i looked at some of the numbers and it looked like in the so there was a bit of a lull period uh, in the inflation numbers in the third quarter i thought okay maybe maybe this is it now and uh, so we still have these very high inflation numbers uh, from the uh, from the spring of 2021, uh, but once we roll them out and we are back to more normal numbers, I mean this could all be done before uh, uh, before everybody needs to get worried. But then in the fourth quarter, I mean everybody got slammed again, and uh, so you get these 0.8 month over month inflation numbers, right? So this is month over month. So you annualize some of these inflation numbers. So we are talking about double digit inflation. I think there was one at 0.9. Um, and um, uh, so, so you get this resurgence in the inflation numbers, which actually means that, uh, so the most recent inflation number that we had was for the CPI is for November actually, right? So that was uh, published in mid December, which is the November number. So we are expecting the, uh, the December inflation number uh, in the middle of January, I think it's January 12th, it might be after this uh, goes online. But uh, so uh, what, what people uh, need to recognize is that if you look at these year over year numbers, right, basically what you're doing is you, you take the, the, the previous month's year over year number, right, and then you kick out one month very way at the back end, and then you add one more at the front end. So and the numbers that we are taking out, right, they are still from now, next year over year number, we are taking out the December 2020 number and we are adding the December 2021 number. So we are still taking out some of these very low inflation numbers, right? Because I, I was just I was telling you about this is a late 2020, everybody was worried about really low inflation. Uh, so we're taking out these very low numbers and we are replacing them with very high numbers. So the year over year numbers will probably still go up for a while. Uh, and uh, until uh, April or so until April and then we would be rolling out some of the really high numbers from 2021 and I hope at least that by April we'll have a little bit lower uh, month over month numbers and then at least the year over year numbers come down and um, yeah and then pro hopefully the Fed can breathe a little bit easy and they say well yeah I mean this is exactly what we expected and uh, it's still too high so we're going to start raising interest rates now uh, uh, to uh, to respond to this but yeah I mean if that doesn't happen right if we keep getting these 0 0.8 0 0.9 1.0 percent month over month numbers uh, yeah I mean then obviously the Fed has to has to step it up a little bit and I think that that might be a little bit of a of a cold shower for everybody. Yeah, it's and, not it's not entirely in their control because a lot of this is just like consumer psychology too. They, the Fed may have four months of patience, but consumers may be like, "Man, this is going right. on a long time. I guess right. it's just going to keep going on." Right. No, I mean, obviously, what the Fed would then say, well, I mean, you can very easily shut down inflation, right? I mean, you cool down the economy, right? As Paul Volcker did it, and um, uh, so. I, there's still a lot of big fans of Paul Volcker. So some of my some of my old colleagues, when I I was working at the Fed from 2000 to 2008, and there there were still some people that that told me, yeah, when I when I graduated from from graduate school, when I was your age, so that's when Paul Volcker once visited, and they were telling these stories about cigar smoking guy, and uh, so he's one of the the greatest heroes of, of, of economics and monetary economics. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so I, there's still a little bit of intellectual influence of Paul Volcker, obviously. Uh, and uh, everybody knows, I mean, the Fed can bring inflation under control by simply creating a demand side recession. We shut down the, the economy again, not, not by Dr. Fauci, but by, but by Dr whoever is in charge of the of the federal reserve so um and uh, and and that will have a cooling effect on on the economy and on prices and uh, now one one hope that i have is that so uh, if you look at some of the the categories right that had some of these huge inflation spikes right so this would be new cars used cars um 
it's it wasn't even healthcare, right? Because healthcare, if you look at very long term horizons, right? So over very long horizons, is usually inflation is two percent on average, and then housing and healthcare are usually three percent, right? There's usually a percentage point higher than everything else, um, and um, but um, during this inflation spike. I mean, you look at some of the categories that had the, the big price spikes, um, they're exactly the categories that, that, that satisfy the, the, following, the following property. So imagine somebody gave you $100,000 and told you, you have to spend these $100,000 as quickly as you can, right? And what would you buy? I mean, you wouldn't buy, you wouldn't buy gummy bears or anything like that. Well, you, you would do the following. You would do... Uh, remodeling of your house, right? You would buy uh, cars, used cars, new cars. Uh, you would travel, right? So a lot of uh, the price spikes, for example, came from uh, rental cars, right? So there was a shortage of rental cars. It probably still is. Uh, and um, so why why was there this this big price spike? I think it's obviously because the government is basically just opening the floodgate and handing people money. And uh, the nice thing is that there are obviously a lot of people that actually needed that financial assistance, right? Um, unfortunately, getting a stimulus check here or some child credit there, I mean, for, for the people who are really needy, that's probably a drop in the bucket. But there will be, for every person who actually got some of this government stimulus who, who needed it, there are probably 10 people who got the same amount of money who didn't need it and flush with cash well how what's the easiest way to get rid of a lot of money right you buy uh, all of these durable goods rvs cars boats uh um and uh, and travel so uh probably if some of this largesse is ending now right i mean for example this uh, this child tax credit i think that's already that's already done as of december so people won't get any money in in january um, so um, the quote unquote, the good news is it's actually, it's obviously bad news for the people who actually needed the money that that money is now uh, phased out. The good news is that, I mean, at least I cross my fingers that this will take a little bit of this pressure off of the, uh, off of prices. Right. So, uh, and I, I would watch basically used car prices because that's that seems to be the the first to respond so everybody with a little bit of extra money they're going to run out and and buy a used pickup truck uh and um because i mean so, some of these used car prices are were so insane right you had something like a 10 percent or 20 percent month over month increase in used car prices and, and Sometimes you could even make out. I mean, this is exactly the the month when the when the stimulus checks went out, uh, and this is no surprise. Uh, you have a big inflation spike then. So my hope is that, uh, as painful as it will be for us to basically get weaned off of some of this uh, this government assistance, it's hopefully will also take care of some of this inflation problem. All right. So you know, I remember when we when we were first speaking about safe withdrawal rates way back. Um, you know, uh, one of the, the, the key takeaways I had was like, you know, maybe, maybe 4% is not the number, but somewhere between three and four, it, it probably won't be less than three. You're probably safe. Right. Um, so, you know, I've, we've been talking about the current climate inflation approaching 6% year over year, at least in the last few months, uh, it's the highest it's been in several decades at the same time, stock valuations are all time highs for, you know, Cape of 40, you know, as you mentioned, um, it sounds like you're saying three and a half percent is actually still probably okay for most people, even when you properly account for all these forces to, you know, ma maintain retirement security. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, and again, I mean, I, I want to avoid talking about setting one single rate, right? Because it has to be custom tailored, right? But uh, I mean, think about the, the most bare bones, the, the worst possible uh, worst case scenario where you have say a 50 year horizon and you have no additional cash flows later on in retirement that, that you can rely on as most people have, right? I mean, uh, uh, I'm a little bit worried about some of the people that retire at age 27 and well, they will have to wait until age 70 probably to get social security. Uh, but for most people who say retire at age 40 or 45, right? There's, there's some social security around the corner uh, it's not going to be zero. Uh, it's not going to be as bad as some people want to make it. 
Uh, but even if you even if you assume, imagine fifty year horizon and no additional cash flows, and you retired in nineteen sixty five, and uh, even then you would have survived fifty years. I think with something like a three point three or three point four percent withdrawal rate, and um, or, or maybe even three point five. I have to have to look up the exact. But numbers, that's but, that's but that's burning down the principal all the way to zero, right? I mean, that's burning down the principal to zero, and uh, yeah, and, and then of course, even if you if you retire, maybe just three months before the all-time peak or three months after the all-time peak, it's, it's, it's already looks a little bit better. And if it's not quite as bad as the 1970s and 80s, uh, or 70s and early 80s, uh, it's, yeah, I, I, I would think that 3.5% is probably is, is pretty safe. I think that the people who uh, propose going below 3% or all the way down to 2%, well, there was one clown in the in the in the fire blogging world who said we have to go down to zero point five percent. I I don't I don't but even want to that, give that's this for shock <laughs> that's for shock value though. That's I, obviously I, a troll. I know I know who that's you're a, about. That's a troll and shock value. So um, that's clickbait. I, I think, <laughs> that's yeah. clickbait exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, th- that might be a, a way too conservative, and uh, I mean even I wouldn't go there. Not. Uh, of course, there would be a way I would go there if, if you say, well, I need to have not just CPI adjustments, but I want to do something like CPI plus 1% or CPI plus 2%. Well, then very quickly, you probably push your withdrawal rate uh, even below 3%. But if you're, uh, if you're okay with CPI plus zero, so you only keep it at CPI, which means there's, there's a little bit of a concern, right? Because you, everybody around you is has some per capita GDP growth and per capita income growth and per capita consumption growth. So you would be eroding away a little bit your, uh, your not your absolute purchasing power, but your purchasing power relative to your peers, so your friends, your neighbors, your relatives. Um, uh, so maybe then you, you want to uh, be a little bit more cautious, but uh, yeah, if, if you're fine with CPI plus zero, I have a hard time justifying less than 3%, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And undergirding all this, uh, just as a reminder, is is what kind of asset allocation? Yeah, so something like a 75-25. I mean, um, back in the old days, people said 60-40. I think 60-40 or, or even 50-50, right? Because 50-50 looked really great during the, uh, uh, during the uh, Great Depression. Um, I wouldn't want to do 50-50 because, or even 60-40, right? With with the negative bond yields, uh, and uh, uh, that that's probably a little bit too risky. Um, and uh, yeah, 75-25. You might even have uh, something like a, a little bit of real estate in there, so either through direct investments or um, uh, through through funds. Um, maybe you can go even a little bit higher that way. But yeah, I mean, if you want to restrict yourself to stocks versus bonds, I, I found that 75-25 gives you a little bit of the sweet spot where um, you don't want to have too much in equities, right? Because if you have a repeat of say 1929, uh, you're going to get really hammered if you don't have enough bonds. Uh, on the other hand, something like a repeat of the 1960s, 70s, early 80s, if you have too much in bonds, Bonds were not really a, a great diversifier at that uh, at that time, and uh, and stocks didn't even drop so much during the 1970s either. So it's it's, it's really the uh, so so 75 25 uh, stocks versus bonds seems to be this uh, the sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. You know, right now, do, uh, I guess other things being equal, is that type of allocation what you would recommend presently? Like, or what are potential yeah. asset allocation changes that investors should consider given Current macro trends, you know, near zero rates. They're gonna, they're definitely gonna start rising. Stock valuations having doubled since. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy to say that doubled yeah, yeah, more than yeah. doubled since March 2020. Yeah. Uh, real estate prices in many places having increased 20 percent or more year over year. You know, like, should we be changing our as the way we think about um, uh, asset allocation uh, and certain asset prices potentially being overvalued? Oh yeah, I mean everything is overvalued. But then again, that is the whole idea of looking at this, uh, this historical simulations, right? We're overvalued. We were overvalued in 1929. We were 
overvalued in the 1960s, uh, and we were overvalued in 2000. Uh, and uh, so my view is that if you hedge against some of these historical worst case scenarios, we should be okay this time around. Mm -hmm. Just for a historical perspective, so right now, the S&P 500 PE ratio is about 30, the CAPE is about 40, the inverse CAPE is about two and a half. Where does that put us in, in, in kind of a historical context in terms of re relative uh, to where yeah. those numbers have been historically? Like how, just oh, so I mean, folks can, understand. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we can, we can, we can talk about a, a whole hour about the, the, the S&P uh, and, and, the, and the CAPE and the, the different PE ratios, right? Um, the, the CAPE, uh, the problem with the CAPE is that, um, so Schiller publishes his sheet, and I think, I don't know, maybe his, uh, his research assistant is not, is not working on this uh, uh, anymore, but the last time I checked, I think is still the outdated numbers from, I think, September. And the earnings numbers he's using to calculate the, uh, the, the CAPE they only go until June, just not a huge problem, right? Because if he takes the 120 month average and he's missing a few months at the end, it's, it's not going to be that much of a problem. Um, but it's it would certainly be a problem, for example, if you just calculate the simple PE ratio, the, the way people normally do is they, they do the trailing PE, right? And they look at the, the most recent um, uh, four quarter uh, aggregate earnings number. But um, I mean, there's still some people who are still floating around the, the Q2. If you're lucky, you get the Q3 number. Uh, Q4 numbers haven't even been coming out yet, right? Uh, but I mean, you can, you can look at some of the, uh, the estimates, right? So S&P, uh, Dow Jones S&P, which is the index provider uh, for the S&P on their webpage, they have not just the, the realized and finalized earnings numbers, right? Because Schiller waits until the earnings numbers for the quarter are finalized. So that's why there's this huge lag in, in the earnings numbers. Uh, but uh, so S&P, they also have obviously the earnings estimates uh, for even the fourth quarter. They, they even have the earnings estimate for the first quarter, right? So we, we haven't even finished Sorry. three days. We haven't even finished three days of the first quarter of 2022. We already have an earnings estimate for the first quarter of 2022, which that might be a little bit hand-waving, but I can tell you that actually the fourth quarter earnings numbers are actually, they're not going to be deviating too much once they are all released over the course of the, of the next few weeks and months. So if we calculate the, the four quarter earnings numbers for Q1 through Q4 of 2021, I think we get aggregate earnings in the S&P of somewhere around $191. Uh, you set that in relation with the, uh, uh, with the S&P price index. And I think you get something like, it's actually under 25. So, uh, and again, I can make it 30 if I play with the numbers a little bit and I take a, a lagging and a lagging number for the uh, for the uh, uh, twelve month earnings, then I can make it thirty, which would sound insanely high because the thirty is not the cape, right? The thirty is the is the twelve month trailing earnings. Um, uh, that would sound definitely very very overvalued. Um, and again, a twenty five is not it's not uh, it's not very nice, right? It's a, it's a little bit scary. But at the same time, it's, it's not wildly overvalued either. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an expensive equity market, but again, I wouldn't be running for the hill, right? And uh, I, uh, I don't know if, if there is even a, an earnings multiple where I would say, okay, from now on, we even have negative, negative uh, equity expected returns. I, I don't know how high that, that CAPE or how, how high that, that PE ratio would have to be before I would say, okay, now we have actually uh, either negative equity expected rate or um, a negative equity premium, right? So you, you sell your equities, you put it in cash, and then you make more in expected terms than with the, expected, uh, than with the, with the equity portfolio. So I, I, we're nowhere no even clo close mm -hmm. to that, right? So so that's why I think, I mean, we still have a positive equity premium. We, we will make money equity over cash and certainly equity over bonds. Um, in expected terms, we'll make more with equities than with bonds uh, and with cash. So I, I think we still, we're still in an okay 
position. And uh, yes, I mean, it's, and that's what I'm saying, right? We should compare this to the historical, potentially worst case scenarios for past retirees. Um, don't quite see how we would be worse than 1929 or how we would be worse than the, the 1960s and 70s. Mm. Um, if, if, um, if something changes, I'm going to post it on my blog if, if my views change. But I mean, it, it's, it's not, I, I don't quite believe that yet, that, that mm. uh, it, it will be worse. I mean, there are obviously challenges, a lot of debt load, uh, talking about the, the, the redistributional challenges. I think there are also some some positive um, things on the horizon, right? I mean, uh, so for example, this whole artificial intelligence and this, uh, the productivity gains um, that um, people were poo-pooing, and I probably I have poo-pooed that uh, for for a long time. But I, I can actually see that some of these uh, uh, some of these uh, new technologies and new technologies that will increase productivity it will eventually hit, right? And, and by the way, it's not going to hit overnight, right? It's not like the internet made everything uh, or, or, or information technology in general made everything more productive overnight, right? And as it's actually, it waited until everybody said, oh, this, is, uh, this was just overblown. This will never be, this will never make us more productive. And that's when all the productivity gains happen, right? It happened with IT in general, right? That took, I mean, that's, that's, that was already around since the 1970s. It took probably until the 1990s until we saw the productivity gains. The same with the internet. Um, and, and the same will be true with uh, some of this machine learning and artificial intelligence, self-driving cars. Uh, and I think there will be some productivity gains and um, not saying that this will suddenly create 10% GDP growth every year, but I think that there might be a little bit of a bump uh, in productivity growth and we can milk this. And maybe the stock market, much smarter than all of us, uh, uh, has already priced that in. Uh, because it's definitely, because I, I was mentioning, for example, the, the, the S&P uh, earnings numbers, right? So if you, if you look at the, the year end, 2021 is $191. And I think the uh, the forecast for 2022 uh, is already over 200. I think it's $211 uh, in earnings uh, over the over the 2022 calendar year. So uh, yeah, I mean, if instead of going 12 months backward looking earnings, you go at the 12 months forward looking earnings, and then look at some of the, the earnings forecasts and the growth forecasts for earnings. Um, uh, Definitely, it's it's all it's priced for perfection, but I don't think we are in any kind of irrational territory here. So mm -hmm. I mean, there is 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 not like um, it's not like the late nine nineteen nineties, right, with pets dot com or anything like that. So it's, it's definitely more fundamental, uh, and uh, there the, there are some some real productivity stories and uh, productivity gains to be had, hopefully, uh, and uh, and that's that's my positive spin. Uh, but then again, I still, uh, if I were to retire today, I mean, I, I would still hedge against that, uh, that worst case scenario, which means very likely you will have a very comfortable retirement where later in retirement, you will notice, ah, I can actually increase my, my, my spending now. You would just do that by lowering your safe withdrawal rate, but like the price prefer price to perfection, um, as you mentioned, uh, I guess, I think what I'm hearing, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that look, all, all asset prices are expensive. Everything has uh, a, an right. elevated risk of declining right now, but what else are you going to invest in? Like, right. I, I, yeah. So just the thing that you can do is control your safe withdrawal rate. I think that's kind of the gist of it, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and this is, this is the, the, the crazy thing that, you know, you go from a 60-40 to a 75-25. It's not despite... The, the high equity values is almost because everything is so expensive. Right? If we had uh, if we had cheaper equity valuations and two percent inflation and eight percent bond yields, right? If we had two percent inflation and eight percent bond yields, I would be hundred percent bonds, right? So uh, why take a chance uh, if I can have a six percent safe withdrawal rate? <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. And uh, and it's it's actually almost because everything is so expensive, you almost have to take a little bit more risk. To, to make it to make it through the next 30 40 50 years right because the, you, you can't have a the simple math is right if you have a zero 
expected return asset and you have a 30 year, let's make it a 50 year retirement horizon, well, you can withdraw 2% on, right? So you almost need to uh, increase your risk exposure and um, that almost hope that, well, you know, um, hopefully we have some kind of a, I mean, they, they, they used to call it the Greenspan put, and then they called it the Bernanke put, and, uh, and now they call it probably the Powell put. Um, I, I think that uh, probably policymakers will, uh, will come to people's assistance, right? If, if the market drops again by, by 50, 60, 70%, it's not going to be like during the Great Depression where the, the Federal Reserve is going to survive. Not our problem. Uh, your own problem if you invested in stocks. Uh, we don't care about your uh, your well-being. Uh, we want to be an independent central bank and uh, uh, bad luck. So I, I think that definitely policymakers have become uh, a bit more uh, have have felt it easier to to come to the assistance of of investors. I wouldn't exactly call it a put option uh, that they provide, but the, um, I think they. Uh, there, there is going to be, I mean, just look at what happened during the, during the pandemic, right? I mean, they says it's basically uh, they had extraordinary Fed meetings between meetings, right? They just had the, the meetings over the phone and uh, basically overnight reduced interest, not just the current interest rate to 0%, but then also said that our, our forecast for 2020, 2021, and 2022 is all 0%, right? So we almost commit to 0% interest, which by the way, they, apparently they're not, being, they're not going to follow that forecast because we do project for uh, um, uh, rate hikes now for 2022. But back then everybody was so scared and they said, look, I mean, this is so out of left field. Uh, we're going to do whatever it takes to, uh, to keep financial markets afloat. And uh, so maybe, maybe we can Take something like 75 percent 25 percent uh equity versus bonds now and uh, it used to be more like the 60 40 is the is the traditional balanced portfolio and uh, but with bond yield so low you probably have to take on a little bit more risk which uh, again as i said maybe the equity risk isn't even that bad anymore uh with uh, with some federal reserve assistance there if you are holding 100 percent um equities right now get knowing that you know, bond yields are so low. Fed, the Fed has already um, uh, made transparent that they intend to increase rates, and they are they will not be shy about increasing them further if they see inflation is just like not tempering. Um, is it wise to um, to move from one hundred percent equities to say seventy five twenty five, knowing that like you, it seems like there's <laughs> there's only downside if you're for for fixed income investments. Yeah, yeah. So and again, if you're not re- if you're not retired yet. Uh, is it, be my guest, be 100% equities. That's what I did, and it worked really well for me. And um, even if you have some short-term volatility, you use the dollar cost averaging. Uh, some of my best investments were putting money in, um, no questions asked, automate your investments at the bottom of the market in in, in 2009, in March 2009. Uh, and um, yeah. I, I, I'm a little bit uh, worried about 100% equities in retirement, right? So because, um, again, I mean, if you go look at 1965 to 1982, uh, that would have been a really, really bad experience. Uh, and, um, uh, and again, bonds were not too much of a diversifier, right? Sometimes people think, and I mean, diversification basically means one asset goes up, the other one goes down. And if we have a negative correlation, like we had during most recessions, uh, stocks go down and bonds go up. Um, bonds still had a little bit of diversifying uh, properties during the 1960s, because both stocks and bonds went down, but bonds didn't go down as much as stocks. So it, it's, it's still better to have 25% in bonds instead of 100% in stocks. Even though everything went down, 25% of your portfolio went down a little bit less than the stock market. So, so it's a, not a very comfortable feeling of, of diversification, but it helped at least a little bit. Um, and uh, so not sure I can, I can uh, with a clear conscience, uh, recommend uh, 100% equities. Um, but then again, so, so for example, I... I have also, I, I have 100% in 
riskier assets, right? I'm, as, I, as I told you, I have most of the portfolio, 70% is in, uh, most of it is in stocks, a little bit in real estate, uh, private equity funds. And then that, uh, that option trading plus preferred shares plus uh, muni bond funds, that's about 30%. If I calculate something like a like a econometric and, and statistical factor model, I get something like it's actually a relatively low equity exposure, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and if I just look at pure correlations and betas of that thirty percent portion, it once I reassemble the whole portfolio and I look at the the, the statistical attribution of that, it also looks like a 75, 25% portfolio. So 75% risky assets, 25% looks like something like bonds or cash. Um, and, uh, and the reason why I'm doing all of this complicated stuff with the option trading and, and the rest of the portfolio, it's, it's not just 75, 25, but they, I have a little bit of alpha on top of that, right? So and that's, that's the other thing that comes out of the statistical uh, analysis. I, 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 I think that I actually add a little bit of uh, um, of extra return that I wouldn't get if I replicated this with just a pure stock versus bond portfolio. But anyways, I mean, even I am not taking on 100% uh, stock exposure. There's, there's something that I, I don't want... I, I don't want to lose one for one. If the stock market goes down mm. again by 50%, I don't want to lose exactly 50%. I want to lose a little bit less than 50%. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so, yeah... <laughs> If, but but then again, uh, uh, obviously a lot of fire bloggers and, and podcasters, everybody, I mean, they, they are claiming they're retired, but uh, they still have 100% uh, equities, but uh, it may work for them because they have the extra cash flow. Um, but uh, yeah, again, if, if you have the flexibility and you say, well, I have 100% equities, I don't want to invest in bonds. And uh, yeah, if it doesn't work out, I can always go back to work and I, I do some little consulting contract to, uh, to supplement the income. And, and you say, well, I want to have 100% equities. I want to stay away from bonds. I, I think that's maybe not a bad idea. But you know, if, if you are... Um, yeah, I don't know if you if you don't really have the uh, the ability to work regularly. I mean, there, there's some early retirees where they're on sailboats or something like that, right? And I mean, they they, they can't just say, "Well, I can, I can always be a Starbucks barista or a Walmart greeter." No, you can't because you're on a sailboat uh, somewhere in the Pacific, um, and and you have this budget. And if you don't make your budget and your hundred percent stock portfolio goes down. Um, maybe you want to be a little bit more cautious, but uh, yeah, I, I think that some early retirees will have the flexibility to well, maybe do a little consulting contract here and there for a few mm-hmm. months a year. If it doesn't work out, um, uh, yeah, I, I I think that wouldn't be a bad idea to uh, to forego the bonds. Yeah, I think what I'm I think what I'm hearing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you are like at the cusp of retirement or in retirement, you have no other hedge, no other income source. It's probably a little bit risky to a riskier to be hundred percent equities. And so if you are, you might be better served to go 75, 25, let's say, uh, even though you know that bonds also face this interest rate risk because, you know, and rates can only go up and the Fed has already signaled their intentions. But if you have some other hedge, maybe you own a rental property, maybe you can easily do some consulting work or whatever, then yeah, I mean, yeah. knock yourself out. Maybe 100% right. equities is exactly the right uh, trade-off given the riskiness of bonds right now. Is that, is that? Mo- yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, and, and again, I mean, so for example, the, the bonds don't really have any risk in the sense that if you buy a 10-year treasury bond right now, and I think the yield as of today is something like a 1.6%. Well, you are going to make exactly 1.6%. But you have to hold I mean, it to maturity. Uh, you, yeah, you have to hold it to maturity. And um, uh, But then again, I mean, even if interest rates go up along the way, right? So you're, the value of that bond goes down. But then also the reinvestment interest rate that you get after that is higher. So there, there is some compensation for that. Um, the other uh, way, uh, which is actually the cleaner uh, uh, comparison is you don't look at the 1.6% yield of one fixed bond. Because for example, if you buy an ETF, yeah, if exactly. you buy the IEF, which is the, the seven to 10 year treasury uh, ETF, which is the, uh, it's, uh, I think it's iShares. Yeah, iShares. 
um, because they keep rolling these bonds, right? Exactly. They sell the ones that drop out of that time window and then they buy the ones that that roll in. So So you you always have a blend. Right. You always have a blend and it's always a, basically a fixed maturity or, well, it's it's hard to do it exactly only the benchmark bond, right? Because that, that would be basically uh, probably even monthly trading, uh, certainly quarterly trading uh, to keep that exactly at the benchmark bond. Um, uh, and uh, so obviously that expected return may or may not be 1.6%, right? Because you have the impact from, from the duration effect. Uh, and uh, so uh, th- that's actually, I did some of this in my, in my consulting gig. So, um, so what is the expected return of, of that rolling the 10 year benchmark bond for the next 10 years, right? And uh, actually right now in the interest uh, um, landscape that we face, uh, that's probably a little bit less than uh, 1.6%. So it's, it's actually, it doesn't have to be less. Um, it's kind of varies over time. But right now, you're probably closer to 1.45% expected return uh, if you do that rolling thing, because you have to balance. So if the yield goes up, you have a negative impact on your returns from the duration. But then if higher yield also means higher income in the future, right? But as normally, uh, it's actually the duration impact is a little bit higher than, mm-hmm. than the impact from higher interest rates. So yeah, I mean, uh, if you do that rolling experiment with a 10 year, it's probably even less than the 1.6% yield right now. And that has to do with how quickly uh, the Fed is going to raise uh, interest rates. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's the, is definitely a concern, but... Um, yeah, but again, it's 1.4% and it's going to be slightly negative real yield, but at least you can be sure that if there is some other blow up, um, say in 2023 or 2024, uh, uh, another pandemic or something like that, and the Fed then has to lower interest rates again to zero and announces a bond purchasing program, uh, and that yield goes from 1.6% to 0.6%, well, then you're golden again, right? So then your, uh, your stocks go down by 30, 40%, but your bond portfolio goes up by probably around eight, 10%, something like that. So uh, yeah, I mean, this, it's, it's, it's a, really a trade-off. So if, if everybody knew how the next recession is gonna look like, is the next recession going to be again, something like a demand recession, right? It's another pandemic that, uh, that lowers everything, lowers growth and lowers interest rates and lowers inflation. Um, then obviously bonds are uh, a really good uh, diversifier. But then again, yeah, what, well, what happens if we have um, something like an overreaction of the Fed? Or, I mean, not, not overreaction. First of all, an overreaction of inflation, and then that causes the, the Fed to... Uh, it's actually... Um, if, if Paul, I think Paul Volcker already passed away. So, I mean, the, Paul Volcker wouldn't call this an overreaction, right? I mean, uh, the, this is, we're already way past the curve potentially, right? If this is, uh, if this uh, six, 7% inflation uh, were to take hold, <clears throat> we are still at 0% interest rate. So that's uh, it's not really an overreaction, right? So we, we would actually have to, uh, it sounds scary. So you would actually have to, if this doesn't come down on its own, right? And we have this basically, for example, something like a wage price spiral, right? Where inflation settles in at 7% and just stays at 7%. Um, we would actually need something like a, a, a Fed funds rate that's higher than the inflation rate to bring that under control, right? I mean, there's, is, it, you can't just fight... Seven percent inflation rate with a two or three percent Fed funds rate. So it has to be the increase of the inflation rate plus a little bit more uh, to to bring inflation under control. There's there's a little bit of fancy monetary policy uh, uh, arithmetic uh, involved in that. Uh, but uh, uh, so yeah, I mean that's that's obviously the risk, right? So bonds could really, really get uh, hammered there if if that were to happen. And uh, then, yeah, maybe maybe you are better off with a hundred percent equity portfolio. At least you take a little bit of a bath short term, but then long term, at least everything is is going back to normal. First of all, stocks are a bit of an inflation hedge anyways because the corporate profits will eventually catch up with with any amount of inflation. 
uh, and so will the 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 price index. Uh, whereas bonds, you know, you get you you take a bath like that, uh, that will never come back, right? So that's a uh, that's really water under the bridge, uh, if you take a big uh, uh, a big cold shower like that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so uh, what we'll what percent see. what percent cash, by the way, or cash like investments, do you think is advisable for investors to be holding right now? Do you recommend like near zero? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I have pretty much zero. Um, and that's because, I mean, at least right now, just the cash flow every month is from, from trading uh, options and the, and the dividend and, uh, and uni bond uh, income. Um, I, um, yeah, I, I don't think I, I have a lot of cash lying around, just, just useless, but um, it goes back to, I mean, it's actually the, uh, before I wrote the the safe withdrawal rate series, I, I wrote a lot about emergency funds, right? So why emergency fund? Why, why I never had an emergency fund while uh, while I was working, and uh, it goes back to the to the idea, you know, when when the stock market is making more than than cash, and um, I I I don't really see the the cash plus maybe the 0.1% that you're making, or, or even when, when, when your money market account makes 2%, right? I don't view this as a 2% gain. I see this as a, as a 3% loss relative to making 5% with the stock market. So um, um, yeah, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, some people will, will say that um, uh, I, I was a little bit gutsy with that move. It definitely worked uh, while I was accumulating. Uh, now the the advantage of cash obviously is that um, yeah it depends again what kind of what kind of recession do you think is the next recession going to be right is it going to be a demand side recession where the Fed has to slash interest rates and start bond buying pro, uh, programs again then yeah okay I mean then in that case your cash investment is some sort of a diversification, right? It doesn't go up when your stocks fall, but at least it doesn't go down either, right? So the cash is basically making uh, whatever policy rate plus a little bit more, whatever your bank offers you for for your money market, or maybe you shop around a little bit, or you do you basically churn these um, uh, intro offers where you you do maybe two percent offer here, and then once that expires, you go to some other. Uh, some other company. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's obviously, so uh, doing the cash as in say money market or, or other short-term instruments would be a good investment if you believe that, oh, no, no, I mean, the next recession, it's not going to be another pandemic. It's not going to be another global financial crisis. Uh, it's going to be basically a repeat of 1973 to 75 or 1981 and 82, uh, where we have inflation. Uh, the Fed has to really step on the brakes really hard, uh, uh, like under Volcker in the early 80s. And um, so it's going to be poison for bonds. It's going to be kind of bad for stocks, uh, maybe not as bad as, a, as another uh, Great Depression, but it's bad enough for stocks that it hurts and then no diversification from bonds. Uh, now, if you had invested during the 1960s and 70s and 80s in just short-term cash, uh, you would have done a little bit better. So I mean, yeah. So it depends on what kind of uh, what kind of recession are you uh, are you trying to hedge against? Right? Yeah. Um, last question: Do you invest in any other asset classes right now for refuge or growth potential? So, like, you know, mm -hmm. there are some asset classes like crypto that have done spectacularly well, but they also don't have a ton of stability or you know maybe right. even accessibility. Right. Um, or is that still like are things like that or private startups, etc still kind of in the realm of like, you can put some play money there, but don't, don't, you know, bet too much. Yeah. I mean, so far I, I haven't even put any play money uh, in crypto. Mm. And um, I, I think I'm, uh, I like the returns I'm making with all my other investments. And um, if that ever changes, I guess I'll write something about it, but uh, yeah, I, I haven't felt the need to do any, anything crypto. And, um, but I can definitely see the lure of it, right? 
So you can say, young do you consider investors. that investing or do you consider that just, just pure <laughs> spec, pure speculation? No, I mean, it's, it's obviously pure speculation, right? So, because, um, so for example, if I invest in a stock, right? So there's a company behind it, there's company, there's capital, there's land, uh, there's intellectual property behind it. It creates profits, right? It, uh, Part of the profits are paid out as dividends. Um, part of the profits will be kept as retained earnings um, and hopefully invested in something profitable and to grow the company internally and endogenously. Um, I don't quite see what is the equivalent of that, uh, of a cryptocurrency, right? So because, I mean, there's obviously some kind of a value there because um, time and effort and electricity and computing power was invested in solving some math problem to um, to create this coin or this Bitcoin or, or, or what other the other coin is. Um, but, but there's nothing fundamental that makes this uh, that makes this grow, right? So the only growth potential is really that you find a greater fool to pay more for the coin uh, when you sell it. Uh, but I mean, I, I could also see some sort of a, a appeal for it uh, in the sense that you know it's a um, there's some liquidity premium as you can you could store uh, some value in something and there's some so probably some privacy uh, um, advantages and um, uh, the people some people say, well, you don't have to pay taxes on your crypto gains. Well, actually you do. Uh, and uh, I, well, you have to I move remember. to Puerto Rico to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so this, uh, it's, uh, I, I could see the appeal, but I, I, it hasn't really um, moved me yet to, to do anything. And, and again, so the, the only way I would really move any amount into crypto would be, I mean, I, I can tell you, for example, I have about $2,000 in my checking account right now, right? So that is the cash that is sitting there doing nothing. And I, I used to run a much tighter ship when I was younger and I didn't quite have as much money as I have today. Uh, but right now, you know, whether it's $2,000 or, or $200 and I put the other $1,800 in the stock market, wouldn't make a big difference for me. Um, but so, so I don't think that crypto really competes with my stock investment or my mm -hmm. real estate investment. I think crypto competes with my $2,000 in my checking account. So oh, interesting. If, interesting. I, if, I, if, if my Wells Fargo checking account had, uh, had an option, okay, well, you have one account that's in dollars and another one is in crypto, right? If I suddenly started having the need to pay my bills in, in any kind of cryptocurrency and I can write a check not in dollars, but in crypto. And uh, I, I get money in income that's paid in crypto, and then it goes into my Wells Fargo crypto wallet. Then I can see the appeal of crypto for me, because obviously crypto, crypto compared to holding dollars, yeah, I could see the appeal, right? So one is dollars, it's just being deflated away by, or melted away by inflation. Um, but I, I don't quite see how crypto would ever compete with, say, a real estate investment or a stock investment, or even even a even a preferred share, right? So the preferred share, there is some capital at Goldman Sachs, and that's working for me. And there are people working working for me and working hard and making profits. And uh, so I. I Whereas, uh, so if, if I have to rank it, right? So real investments, stocks, after that it's crypto. And after that is cash as, as in dollars, mm. cash in a, in a checking account in my wallet. And uh, yeah, it's better. So crypto is better than cash, but I don't really see that crypto is better than stuff. Even though, I mean, obviously, you know, if I had moved all my money into crypto a few well, years of course, ago, I mean, right? Hindsight is always 2020. Hindsight, right? I mean, but there are some people, you know, they mortgaged their, they mortgaged everything, their houses and, uh, yeah. uh, and, their, and their mom's house and grandmom's house and their credit cards and put that in crypto. And, it's also and extraor look, extraordinarily look, volatile. <laughs> They it's look true. really golden now, and um, who knew that this is how it's going to work out? I mean, it could also just go down again because, as, yeah. as I said, the, this, the, the fundamental value 
I don't I don't quite see that, right? Because I think in terms of the value of an asset, I say, well, what is what are what are the earnings? You do it either with earnings or through dividends. Uh, and you, you you do a spreadsheet, you do the net present value of all of these uh, future earnings or dividends, and uh, and there is your value, and then you compare it to uh, the value of the of the asset. And if it's uh, if it lines up, then it's a good investment. And if it's undervalued, it's even better. If it's overvalued, no, it's not so good. Uh, but I, I don't really quite see what is that what is that cash flow out of uh, crypto. I mean, there are obviously some people now who you know they have their crypto and then they lend it out. To it's, it's, it's basically like securities lending, right? I mean, so yeah. for example, you, you can own Tesla stocks, uh, and then you can make a little bit of extra yield because the your broker can lend it out to people who want to short that. And uh, so that kind of securities lending apparently exists also for crypto. And um, yeah, maybe maybe that's that's the solution, right? You can you can do some uh, uh, there's I think there's some exchanges where uh, where they actually pay you some sort of an interest on your mm-hmm. uh, on your bitcoin holdings uh, and it's, it's probably more of the the major cryptocurrencies obviously the ones that are used by some some hedge funds for some arbitrage strategies yeah but yeah. Uh, it does uh, seem i i'm wondering and like maybe i should do an episode on this because people keep asking me about it like oh can you do an episode on crypto it does seem like the market cap of this is starting to become a little bit too big to ignore. It's like something like two yes, trillion dollars. Absolutely, and yeah. So absolutely. certainly, most of that is Bitcoin and Ethereum, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm, um, uh, still, I mean, <laughs> I mean like yeah. Two- I mean, you compare that to, I mean, the U.S. money supply. I mean, you can't really compare it to the M zero money supply, right? You have to compare it to something like the M two because it also includes some electronic money. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's more than just a few percent right i think it's something like 10 percent of the u.s money supply uh and um yeah so <laughs> yeah it's a quite quite extraordinary it's but uh, considering i mean considering how many uh even if you say well the crypto has value because well it is a store of value and it can be used as a transaction um the, it, it's 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 not going to get even close to the, the number of transactions that are done in the United States dollar, right? If you if you calculate all the transactions that are that are made in cash, in uh, in ACH, in in wire transfers, in credit card transactions, I mean this it has to be in the billions every day, right? And um, I don't quite see that how how Bitcoin or or crypto gets even close to that, but maybe. Right. It was 10 years down the road. Who knows? Who knows? All right. Well, Carson, this has been you know, a, a delight as always. Again, a really uh, good, stimulating, mm-hmm. meaty conversation. I might have to break this up into two episodes, but I've, I've oh, loved it. It's, 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 it's been great. It's been great. I always yeah. love uh, mind melding with you and uh, getting your thoughts on all things safe withdrawal rates and, and macroeconomics. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And we'll make sure we link to all the stuff in the show notes. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Bye.